you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 17. We are walking through the book of Revelation line by line and verse by verse, and I hope you are enjoying the study. Uh, it is much study. Uh, this week is one of those that normally I look at six different commentaries, and this week I, I went to ten, all right, because I know what will happen. There is a passage really soon, really quick, that you know, as far as interpretation is, uh, there's two good interpretations of that. And I'm not saying, I, you know, normally I can say this is the one, I'm 100% sure, uh, but I cannot say, and it's really not going to change anything because the bottom line is God wins at the end. Okay? So what is funny is, remember a couple of weeks ago where I didn't side with some two well-known authors? Well, one of the two I didn't side with this week, I sided with. All right? So all it tells you is you got to follow your heart, you got to follow the Holy Spirit, and God will work everything else out. Today we're studying uh, Babylon Revealed. Babylon Revealed, if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us. Number one, Babylon's time is short. Folks, it is short. Number two, Babylon will make war. There is going to be a war of wars at the end of the tribulation period. And number three, Babylon will be destroyed. It will be destroyed. You know, revelations have been called the tale of two cities. One is Babylon, which represents the evil world and opposes the things of one true God. And folks, I am telling you, when we talk about the harlot, we're talking about false religious systems. In any religion that doesn't have God as supreme, and especially if they deify a man, it is a false religion. I don't care. You name it. Okay? Some people have a problem with that. You know, they think, well, we just should love everybody, and we should, and we should love everybody. But if somebody's uh, teaching false doctrine, we have a responsibility as, as men of God to to uh, expose them, to say, this is not right. Its character and destiny are described in detail in chapter 17 and 18 of Revelation. The second city is the New Jerusalem, and its glory and goodness are described in chapters 21 and 22. You know what? It's been, it's been basically, when we get there, 20 chapters of gloom and doom. And I'm gonna, I'll be glad to get to 21, and we're talking about heaven. All right? When you look at the book of Revelation as a whole and ponder what the angels are revealing, you can only come to one conclusion. All God's plans for history from beginning to end has this one goal in mind. Worship God. Worship God. Don't worship wealth, power, pleasures, or people of this world. Worship God. Why? Because Babylon and all it represents will one day be destroyed. The New Jerusalem and all it represents will last forever. History truly tells his story. The everlasting, never-changing story of Jesus Christ our Lord. Restoration and redemption is, is the story of our Messiah, King Jesus. So let's look at Revelation 17. Verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. I, I do get amazed when I read through Revelation because they have these pauses in places. And especially before here, uh, it really caught my attention because, again, there's going to be two opinions, and I'm going to share both of these opinions with you and let you know what I think. But it, it takes wisdom. Folks, we need to pray for wisdom. And wisdom comes from knowing the Word of God. You need to know what the Word of God says so that you can defend it. You need to know what the Word of God says so you can obey it. You need to know what the Word of God says to, so you can follow God's will for your life. So wisdom, and, and you think of the book of Proverbs. It's a book of wisdom. And I know it's hard to read, it's choppy, and it goes up and down on subjects, 
But I am telling you, there's one uh, passage, Proverbs chapter 4, go with me there, and it is plain as day, Proverbs 4, what God is wanting. Proverbs 4, verse 5. Get wisdom. How do you get it? Read the Word. Get understanding. That's not just knowledge, folks. That's discernment. The Spirit helps us with discernment to make the right decisions. And folks, our decisions need to line up with the Word of God. There's so many people, they'll do right, they'll do right. Even preachers, they'll preach right, they'll preach right, and then they'll throw a sentence in there, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. And if that happens, I just turn the channel on my television set. We don't need, we need God's wisdom. We need his discernment. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. We're not talking about my words. We're talking about the holy word of God. That's what we need to listen to. Do not forsake her. She will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. And folks, salvation is the most important thing. But even how do you get through, how do you get salvation? Through the word of God. How do you know how to be saved? Through the word of God. Folks, it takes two things: the word of God and the spirit of God for salvation. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. In all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace and a crown of glory she will deliver to you. And we know there is a crown of glory that is given to every person that is saved and that is a born-again Christian. So right off the bat in our text, it says, get wisdom. Now, look at the rest of this verse 9. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. And here's where it, it, it kind of, it, it's not convoluted, it's just there's two strong opinions here. All right, there is the opinion, and uh, this is the one that I still believe. I believe they're talking about uh, the seven empires. All right, it has been mentioned before, and the seven empires, I, I've, I know I've read them twice, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, uh, Rome, and the Antichrist. And we know that uh, in John's times, five of these have already passed, and he is living during the Roman Empire time. And we know the kingdom that still comes will be the kingdom of the Antichrist. So because of that, and, and, and again, this is my opinion, the second opinion here is, are the seven mountains on which the woman sets. And there are Bible scholars a lot smarter than I am that believe these are the seven hills around Rome. And I will say that it really is a possibility. But the reason I say it's not, I, I, I jotted down four reasons why I believe this is still talking about the seven empires. Number one, the Antichrist kingdom will be worldwide, not just one part of the world. And number two, this is the one that I believe seals it for me, which we covered in chapter 16, verse 19. The great city is named specifically Babylon. All right? Three, the phrase, when the woman sits, you'll find that this is the third time you will see this in our text. Before, she sits on many waters. The second time we saw, she sits on a scarlet-colored beast are figures of speech, okay? They are not literal things she sits on. So the seven mountains must be some bit, a symbolic also. Again, my opinion. Some try to make it the Roman uh, rulers or the emperors of Rome. And, and it's not far-fetched. I'm just saying it is not crystal clear. And folks, to people, I'm just telling you, that are much smarter than I am. Verse 4, this scripture calls for wisdom and spiritual discernment. Bible scholars all agree that this is vision is difficult and complex 
and we need to bathe it in prayer, and we need to, uh, you know, make up our minds which way we want to go. So I'm sticking with Babylon, but if you are talking about Rome, then, then I don't have a huge problem with that. It's not going to it's kind of like splitting hairs, folks. Whether it's in Rome or in Babylon, and I believe it's the new Babylon, the rebuilt Babylon, the Antichrist is going to rule there, and I'm telling you, uh, you know, it, that city is going to be destroyed. All right, it says, and there also are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And we mentioned the five that is already in the past. Uh, Rome is the empire and the Antichrist. And then it says, and when he comes, he must continue a short time. I believe the Antichrist in the three and a half years, and we understand that, you know, it re restarts uh, the temple worship and he uh, makes peace and uh, there's going to be peace in the Middle East. And there's going to be three and a half years of peace and things seem to be going along real well. But I'm telling you, when it hits the middle of the tribulation period, everything changes, all right? And that's what I believe he is speaking here. I think, and when you think of eternity, three and a half years, you have three and a half good and three and a half uh, total chaos, total corruption. Uh, the bowls, the judgments, and all that going on would be a short time. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is the seven, and is going in to perdition. And we know that the Antichrist is also going to, uh, you know, pretty much mimic what Jesus did. Jesus uh, died on a cross. He was three days in the grave, and he rose again. And he is going to fake his death, mimicking Jesus Christ. And that's where the world as a whole is going to turn and follow the Antichrist. See, before this, it was the harlot. It was false religion. Uh, it's just, you know, that, that, that is prevalent. And folks, it's prevalent today, but in these biblical times, in these prophecies, it's going to, you, you really uh, have to look at it. it it'll almost seem like wrong is right and right is wrong. And by the way, you know what I have a problem with? I have a problem with people that want to invoke their First Amendment rights, but yet when we stand up and we preach, and we preach something against what they believe, you know, they're going to throw the book at me. They're going to do this. And folks, I'm telling you, I told you before, it's coming. They're going to take away our tax exempt. That's the first thing they're going to do. And then they're going to try to start telling us preachers what to preach. And I mean it with all my heart. I will not back down. I'm not looking for a fight, but I am telling you, we have to follow the Word of God. And you think about it, censorship is already starting. It has already started in America. We can protest everything in the world, but when Christians show up, uh, we, are the, we are the minority. We are the narrow-minded folks. We are people that think, forget it, folks. We follow the Word of God. And that's what is going to happen in these last days. Now, when you look at the seventh and the eighth, that confuses some people. But the reason I told you about that is because that's exactly what's going to happen, folks. All right? The, fault, the, the Antichrist will fake his death, and he would be the seventh ruler. And then the eighth one, when he comes back, the first half of the tribulation and the second half of the tribulation also. Hold your uh, finger there and go to Daniel with me. Now, when I wrote this, I wrote this probably about three weeks ago. And I had this scripture all, all ready to go. And to be honest with you, I could preach this scripture for one, for, for one solid sermon. So I'm going to give you the overview here without explaining each and every line because it is a repeat of history, folks. Okay, and it's a familiar, the reason I chose this is because we understand a Daniel in the lion's den, and we understand why he got thrown into the lion's den. But in verse 36, this is the dream, and we know it's Nebuchadnezzar. Now we will tell the interpretation of it, verse 36, before the king, 
You, O king, are, are a, uh, a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Folks, God controls everything. Why do you think he put Pharaohs in the Israelites in the Old Testament? Why did he put them in their lives? So, they would, uh, so he could persecute them. Why? Because they were going with the world. They were being like the world. They were forsaking their God. And God manipulates even rulers to get God's people's attention. And wherever the children of men dwell in, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hands, and he's made you ruler over them all. And the thing you have to understand in these, this next two verses Egypt has already happened. Assyria kingdom has already happened. And he is speaking about the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. It says, you are this head of gold. And the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, was the Babylonian kingdom. And Jeremiah called, the Babylon, uh, called Babylon a gold cup in the Lord's hand. And his kingdom lasted from 636 B.C. to 539 B.C. So the first head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar. But after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours. And this one is the Medo-Persian kingdom, the breast in the arms of silver. Darius the Mede conquered Babylon. Listen, folks, you may be king for a while, but I'm telling you, if you are not under the authority of God, your kingdom's going to fall. They have done it all through history. And I'm telling you, it will happen. Then the third kingdom of bronze, the belly and the thighs of bronze, that is the Grecian kingdom. And Alexander the Great established what was probably the largest empire in ancient times. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks into pieces and shatters everything. And the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay are the Roman empire. Iron represents strength, but clay represents weakness. As great as Rome was, they had law, they had organization, they had military might, but I am telling you, God is King of King and Lord of Lords. And the destruction of the image, this is the coming of Jesus Christ, the stone to judge his enemies and to establish his universal kingdom. Now skip down to 44. And in the days these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Every week that we have studied Revelation, I've tried to take you back to an Old Testament time and an Old Testament prophecy. And folks, every one of these prophecies either have come true or will come true in the future. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I am telling you, Babylon will be destroyed. Inasmuch as that the stone was cut out of the mountain with hands, and that it was broken to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, even at that time, I'm telling you, the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up was destroyed. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. So we see all through history a pattern. We see empires that what some people thought were invincible, that, that this, this empire will always be. I am telling you, they will be destroyed. So we see Babylon's. Babylon's time is short. And look at the second thing. Babylon will make war. Look at verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom yet. And these are the ten kings and the ten kingdoms that are to come. These are the ones that will line up with the Antichrist and will give allegiance to the Antichrist. But they receive authority for one hour as kings. All right? Before it was a short time, here he's saying one hour because when we look at this last part, it will take place at the last 
part of the second part of the great tribulation. We are getting towards the end. And these verses that we are showing here are kind of summing up what is going to happen at the end. As kings of, with the beast, these are of one mind. They will give their power and authority to the beast. And folks, I am telling you, they are going to line up with them. They are going to line up government-wise. And you think about it. The whole thing, we, we said this at the start. What are they looking for? What is Satan looking for? A one-world government. A one-world currency, which we are heading that way. Folks, I'm telling you, between that and artificial intelligence, you better keep your ears open, and you better keep your face in the Word of God, and you better be able to discern what is right and what is wrong. Because there's so much wrong here. And, and it's not scary to me, because you have the Holy Spirit in there, in you. You should be able to discern. You should know when something doesn't seem right. Verse 14, and these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overthrow them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Folks, he is, they are talking about the battle of, battle of Armageddon. And these ten kingdoms will get their armies together. They get their... Uh, soldiers together, and they will all come against Jesus Christ. And folks, I am telling you, and even with us folks, we were ought to be gone. We will already be raptured. And when we come back, we are just coming back as support folks. We are not fighting the battle. I'm telling you, the battle's already been won. The war has already been won. With one breath, Jesus can wipe out it doesn't matter how many are in this army. And he's going to do that, folks, at the Battle of Armageddon. And it says, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. He's talking about the saints of God. He's talking about those who have been martyred. He's talking about Christians that have accepted Christ. We get to be on the winning team. We get to follow Jesus Christ. Why? Because we were called. You were called. Your name, before the foundations of earth, God says, I want you. I chose you. We didn't choose him. He chose us. You're chosen and faithful. Faithful. All three of those things we should understand about who we are in Christ Jesus. And we as Christians need to be faithful until the end. Matthew 24. We talked, we've talked about this, but I want to remind you. Matthew 24, verse 26. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also the coming of the Son of Man uh, man be. Folks, nobody knows the date. Nobody knows when Christ, Jesus, is coming back. But I'm telling you, someday, it may be a Sunday morning, someone gets saved in a church somewhere. And I'm telling you, that is the last person. And God will turn to Jesus and look over at him on the, his right side and say, go get my bride. For wherever the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered together. And folks, uh, you know, again, it speaks of him, Jesus, destroying things. Immediately, look at verse 29. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will darken and the moon will not give its light. Stars will fall from the heavens and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with uh, power and great glory. Folks, I'm telling you, I could not tell I know at least three times this week, somebody, I've run into uh, somebody, uh, a church member, and, and in all three times, they brought up, 
I'm waiting for the rapture. Folks, we need to be anticipating that. We need to believe that. And, and that's what he's saying. He's saying God will come and get his own. Man, don't be afraid. I'm telling you, fear is the thing that Satan wants you to do. He wants you to live in fear. And we have nothing to fear. Nothing. Verse 31, And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of, end of heaven to the other. Folks, God will take care of his own. We are going to be raptured out of here and we are coming back with God. And you know what? We're on the winning team, folks. On the winning teams. Third thing, Babylon will be destroyed. Look at verse 15. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And we've seen that before. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate, naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. See, the great harlot was the religious system of the days. The re religious system. And there's all kinds. Folks, there are so many. And here's the difference. Religion and righteousness are two totally different things. Righteousness comes from God. Religion is man-made righteousness. And we don't need to be religious, folks. We need to be holy. We need to be uh, Christ-like in what we do. And what, what the Antichrist will do when he comes in, he will destroy the religious system and set up his own system, put up his own image, and command everyone on earth to bow just like Nebuchadnezzar did when we read our scripture earlier. Folks, it's coming. It's coming. And if I were you, and I miss the rapture, as soon, folks, you are going to know when the rapture comes if you're left behind. You're going to know it. Hey, you're in an airplane, one of the pilots is saved and the other one's lost. Well, what about if both of them are lost? Folks, that plane is going to hit the ground. In all chaos, somebody driving a car. My advice to you is when it happens and you are left behind, you bow down, you bow on the ground, you get on your knees, you ask God to forgive your sins, you accept Jesus Christ into your life, and you will be protected from then on. I didn't say your life may not be taken, because it could be taken. I'm telling you, uh, the harlot's not going to like you, and the beast sure not going to like you. But your soul is the most important thing in your life. And then it says, For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdoms to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Folks, it isn't fulfilled yet. Even in our studies, we're getting to the end of Revelation. But it will not be fulfilled until Jesus comes and the church is raptured and they go through the tribulation period. Then we have the thousand-year millennium period, which we will be talking about later. And the woman whom you saw is this great city which reigns over the king of the earth. Whether it is Rome or whether it is a new rebuilt Babylon, uh, I'll let you decide uh, for yourself. 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. All God's promises are going to come true. All of them. All of his prophecy will come true. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. The Bible says in verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him. He's talking about Jesus Christ. And given him the name which is above every name. Jesus. Say it with me. Jesus. Say it again, Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow 
every tongue will confess. No, every knee shall bow, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And I'll tell you this, you will either confess he is Lord as one of his children or as one of his enemies. And folks, God has given everyone a chance to be saved. God has given everyone a choice to make. And my prayer today for you is, if you haven't accepted Christ into your life, that you would invite him into your life. You would ask for forgiveness of your sins and that you would uh, ask him to be Lord of your life. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for the promises of the Bible. And God, they really are. They are, yes, they are. Amen. And God, we know how this thing's going to end. And God, it's not going to be pretty. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just convict hearts. God, if somebody needs to be saved today, God, I pray they would put their pride down. God, I pray that they would think this through and they would understand that heaven is forever, but so is hell. Eternity is forever. And God, I pray that you would give them the courage to come down and confess you as Lord. And God, for the Christian, Lord, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And God, I pray that we would be faithful. I pray that we would share the gospel with folks. I pray that we would be the example that we need to be in these last days. God, if there's someone that needs to follow you in baptism, God, we would just rejoice with them. We would love to baptize them. Or if they need to come on church membership, God, I pray that you would just move, and I pray that they would listen and come. God, this is your church. This is your world. God, we're just a part of it. So God, thank you for allowing us to be your children, to worship you, to look at the Word of God, to study the Word of God. And God, where we need to make changes, I pray we would make changes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?